Welcome to episode four of the Zero Pressure podcast series, a relaxed conversation with those on the cutting edge of science and technology, hosted by me, Helen Sharman, and presented by Imperial College London and Saab. The Zero Pressure podcast is looking at how science and technology can positively contribute to solving complex, interrelated global challenges of today and tomorrow. Throughout this series, we've been investigating pioneering technologies and speaking to thinkers and doers at the leading edge. We've been talking about a broad range of issues, including what the future of space exploration might look like in 2050, autonomous systems and the ethics surrounding their use and development, and the future of artificial intelligence and the third wave. Coming up in today's episode, we'll be discussing if we'll ever be able to do something useful with a quantum computer and deliver a public benefit at scale or solve a major real world problem. And if so, when? When you talk to different physicists, they believe their system is always the best system and what's going to build a quantum computer. And, uh, you know, I like that because everyone's enthusiastic about what they're doing. A number of big corporations are investing, Google, IBM, Microsoft, you know, the, the UK has committed over the past five and for the next few years uh, about a billion pounds. The uh, European Union quantum flagship program is about a billion euros. The, the US National Quantum Initiative uh, is one and a half billion dollars. There are big programs in Singapore, in Canada, Australia uh, and Japan. And of course, then there's a very big Chinese effort. So by the time you add all that up, you know, a million here, a millionaire, pretty soon it adds up to real money. People have been working on quantum computing for decades. One of the difficult aspects around the research is that often it needs to get very cold. I was interested to learn that the operating temperature of the D-Wave 2000Q quantum computer is 0.015 Kelvin. That's a temperature so close to absolute zero that atoms and molecules are almost stationary. In comparison, interstellar space is a balmy 2.74 Kelvin. Most of us are accustomed to using devices that rely on quantum effects. You know, the semiconductors in our smartphones, in fact, all computer chips, solid state imaging devices and lasers, they all derive from quantum physics. But what's new is that now we're able to control more of this very small scale behavior and quantum technology could be transformative right across society. There's potential for improvements to a load of everyday technology like navigation, medical imaging and extremely powerful computing, allowing us to perform complex tasks that are just not possible in a lifetime with classical computers. Happily for many of us, we don't need to understand the science behind a device to use it, or oftentimes even to design it. But I think it's worth mentioning one of the principles that quantum computers rely on. Instead of storing data as the binary ones and zeros of digital computers, where each bit has a value of either zero or one, quantum computers use quantum bits, or qubits for short, spelt Q-U-bits, that can exist as a one, a zero, or a combination of both, with a probability of being one and a probability of being zero. This creates a huge range of possibilities and fewer steps, allowing for incredibly fast calculations. So there's a bit of a global race going on to scale and deliver a quantum computer and there is big investment in different platforms and technologies. Our first guest is Professor John Martinez, who's Professor of Physics at the University of California at Santa Barbara. John's team partnered with Google to develop a useful quantum computer, and in 2019, they claimed a world first quantum supremacy, which is a computer that can perform a calculation no conventional computer can do in a feasible time. More recently, John spent time with Australian startup Silicon Quantum Computing. John was awarded the Fritz London Memorial Prize in Low Temperature Physics in 2014. And this year, he received the John Stuart Bell Prize for research on fundamental issues in quantum mechanics and their applications. Welcome, John, to Zero Pressure. Thanks. Thanks for the invitation for being here. Now, what, in your view, is going to be the real value of quantum computing to society at large? 
Uh, well, of course, what's interesting about quantum computing is that uh, it sh- promises it should be able to do computations that no classical computer can do. Uh, it, it's projected that uh, it has uh, what's known as exponentially more power than a, a quantum computer due to the fundamental nature of computing with quantum mechanics. And because of that, uh, there might be uh, problems, let's say, for example, in quantum chemistry, where you can solve that where you can. So quantum chemistry is a, a, a field of research where people try to understand how uh, atoms bind into molecules instead of doing physical measurements on the molecules by actually computing it with a conventional computer using the laws of quantum mechanics. And it turns out that this is hard to do because of the complexity uh, of these uh, calculations in these quantum states. But if you kind of map the problem of solving it with a quantum computer, which also has this kind of exponential power, then uh, you you should be able to solve the problems uh, much more effectively than people can do now. And with with solving uh, quantum chemistry, one can probably do a variety of uh, uh, research into uh, new molecules and how they they work and how they bind and what what they do, and uh, this should uh, aid people in developing new chemicals, new drugs. Let's say better uh, batteries for, for uh, transportation and the like. Uh, so it could have a very large impact on on the the world and and be a very important contribution. So you're saying it might enable us to sort of do chemistry from the bottom up almost, building molecules atom by atom, theoretically. The, yes, and theoretically, instead of having to go in the lab and build them, which often takes a very long time to do the experiments, you design them with the computer, just like we design many things around us right now. And uh, given that physics and quantum mechanics, you can compute it, but it's computationally very difficult then you could have a real advantage doing that with a quantum computer. That's really interesting, John. Let's come back to that later. When are we going to see these kind of benefits, though? Because, I mean, we've been hearing sort of little bits of discussion every now and again. Oh, quantum computing, um, it's going to do all these wonderful things. Um, are we going to have these wonderful new materials or other things, you know, five years, 30 years time? When do you think? Well, OK, it's still research and it's going to take us some time to do that. Um, the quantum supremacy experiment you you mentioned at the introduction was just a, an experiment to show that a quantum computer could be powerful, okay, but not necessarily useful. It was a mathematical crafted problem. It was important because it shows that the quantum mechanics works properly and you can actually build a system to do that. And I'd say that the quantum computing has been experimentally researched for a couple of decades right now. And it's just uh, hard to put uh, this machine together, but we're making steady progress and we've made a big milestone now that we've done something powerful, but we still have to make the machines better. And also people are working on the the algorithms to make them in a sense easier to run. For example, you can uh, estimate uh, that if you make the qubits a little bit better than we have now, maybe you would have to make about a, a million physical qubits to start doing some of these useful calculations. And, you know, okay, we're around, let's say 50, right, 50 qubits right now. So it's gonna take uh, a, few, a few years to get there. Uh, the group, group at Google, for example, said that they're hoping to build a million qubit machine by uh, the end of the decade. So let's say in about 10 years, maybe that's optimistic, maybe not, but, you know, people are planning to build such a complex machine now. And, uh, you know, we just have to see what kind of progress is made, being made. It's not forever that it's going to take. People are really working hard on it. And uh, we'll just see what happens. You're a very practical person, aren't you? I mean, um, what, when do you actually uh, discovered or realized that you'd got that quantum supremacy? That must have been a huge moment. I mean, w- what had it actually taken in practice for you to achieve that? Uh, well, you know, I've been working on this essentially since my PhD thesis in, uh, that was what, 1986. Okay, so I, I, I've been working on this for a very long time. 
Uh, I would, when at UC Berkeley with John Clark and Michelle DeVeray, did some of the initial experiments, just showed that you could make a qubit out of superconductors. That wasn't even known at the time that that would work. And it's only because of research over many decades, but by myself, but by many, many other people inventing a lot of things to, to do that. Uh, in around 2014, we moved to, I moved my group, me and my, myself and my group to uh, Google, where we wanted to build a useful quantum computer. And after a few th years there, we had the idea of doing the quantum supremacy experiment. And then we, we, we worked on that very hard. So it, it, yeah, I've been thinking about building a, a quantum computer, a big quantum computer for many years. At, at UCSV, we actually had the idea of the computer we were going to build. Uh, and it just took a lot of years to uh, figure out how to put it together. And, uh, you know, uh, we cooled down the first big chip uh, that we thought maybe could could get to it. And it took about six months or so of writing software and tuning it up and figuring out how to work. Eventually, we were doing more and more qubits. And eventually, we got to a, a, a level of, of, of the 53 where the, the things work really well. So tell me a bit more about why it has to be cold. Um, is it just the uh, electric circuitry in superconductors or is there other, other bits that have to be cold? And uh, is that the biggest challenge that you have with uh, quantum computers? Well, OK, so uh, in, in a superconductor, obviously, you have to be cold for superconductivity. And the reason you use superconductivity is you want very low energy loss of the system and the superconductors give you that. So what are the different methods? Because I, as I understand, you can use the superconducting computers. There are, you know, we can get make these qubits from photons, and there are other different ways. So, um, I mean, is that the what, what would you say is the best technology, the, the one that's most likely to reap as advances in the future? So, so I, I like this question because when you talk to different physicists, they believe their system is always the best system, and what's going to build a quantum computer. And, uh, you know, I like that because everyone's enthusiastic about what they're doing. Uh, every system is hard. Every, every system you have to work through a bunch of technology to get it to work. Uh, and, uh, you know, and I would say we don't know. I mean, right now it's a very interesting time where people are building these systems uh, and, and seeing how they work. They're trying to scale them up. And uh, we just have to see, uh, you know, which systems work and which, which systems don't work. Uh, I'm going to say what's nice about superconductivity is that they, they have been working for a long time now. We built this complex chip. Uh, we know ideas on how to scale them up. A million qubits is hard, by the way. It's going to be a big system and there's going to be have to, a lot of things invented. But what I would say is, in my view, and I, I think people would generally agree with this, but I'm, I'm a little bit more, let's say, pushy on this, this topic, is that what we really need to do in all qubits, superconductivity, all qubits, is make them better. OK, so right now you have a, an error in the qubit every, let's say, 200 operations or so, something like that. And you can do a lot of interesting things at that level. But uh, you really need to get it down to an error in 1,000 operations, maybe an error in 3,000 or 10,000 operations. And by doing that, you can either do more interesting applications right away, or you can build something what's called an error-corrected uh, quantum computer, where the quantum computer can detect and correct its own errors and then you can have it really, really small errors and do much more complicated uh, uh, calculation. What's the most important thing you think a useful computer, quantum computer, will be able to do that a conventional one can't? Um, well, one important thing is, is this quantum chemistry. And I like that because we have known applications uh, and, uh, you know, if we improve materials, that could have a huge uh, uh, impact technologically and, and huge impact on how the, the world works. The, the other important thing, which other important application, which is um, uh, doesn't really have a hard proof yet that you can do it, but everyone really thinks that we can do that, is use quantum computers for optimization problems. Uh, 
let's say you have a financial portfolio and you want to mathematically optimize given some some uh, some inputs. Uh, you 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 can do that classically, but it's hard to show that that's an optimal solution. And even if you improve something by five percent or ten percent, then uh, it, it's really useful. And quantum computers are thought maybe to be able to crack that problem. Also, uh, you know, a big thing right now is artificial intelligence via deep neural nets. Uh, they work really well. They need very large training sets and large time to, to train. Uh, maybe if you use quantum mechanics, these can be trained more like the human brain uh, with, you know, smaller data sets. And, and, uh, and then uh, you, could, uh, you could do these artificial intelligence applications more efficiently that way. Thanks, John. So if you can hang around a bit, um, I will come back to you shortly. I just want to remind you that you can submit comments and questions via our podcast Twitter at Zero Pressure Pod. We're keen to hear from you and may even feature your questions in the next episode. So please do get in touch. John was talking about how experiments in quantum computing research have been going on for, well, a few decades now. We've made great progress, but we need more innovation before we can realise some of the potential that could span finance, logistics and quantum chemistry that we can use to create new molecules theoretically and hence new materials in the future. He discussed the various challenges of making quantum computers using his approach, including why some quantum computers need to operate at a very low temperature. Our second guest is Professor Ian Wormsley, the Provost or Chief Academic Officer of Imperial College London and Chair in Experimental Physics at the college. In recognition of his contributions to quantum optics and ultrafast optics, Ian was elected as Fellow of the Royal Society in 2012, and he was awarded the Society's Rumford Medal for pioneering work in the quantum control of light and matter on ultra-short timescales. Ian is co-founder and chairman of Orca Computing, a startup working on quantum computers. Welcome to Zero Pressure, Ian. Hello, Helen. Thank you. So what's the potential here in your view? I mean, in what ways might quantum computers have an advantage over the classical digital versions? Well, I, Helen, I, I would echo the points that John has made. Uh, one, in doing calculations that you simply can't do on any conceivable uh, regular conventional computer. And those would include things like uh, uh, optimization for logistics and the ability to really understand and study materials right at their most fundamental level. Uh, and as John alluded to, that's about being able to build molecules or uh, super light materials or things that can be uh, useful useful as drugs, for example. So how are we going to get there? I mean, to actually realise and deliver this, um, I'm not thinking now particularly about the practical aspect. John's um, given us a lot of information about that. But um, in terms of sort of internationally, there are a lot of different organisations doing bits of research here and there. Um, is it possible that one particular organization could develop something so absolutely amazing in advance of anybody else um, and they would sort of run ahead with the whole thing and then the whole world might be beholden to that one organization. Well, I suppose that may be possible, Helen, but I think it, it's important to note that there is a huge set of efforts internationally, as you, you've mentioned. And, and what that means is that there is the sort of stimulation of competition. People make improvements in one part of the world and those improvements can be adopted in another part of the world. And there's a, quite a number of different platforms that the final form of any quantum computer I don't think is settled at the moment. The, the nature though at the moment of these international programs is that, that, that there's quite a lot of both public and private money going into these sorts of developments. We're, we're not at the stage yet where, uh, where, where one entity has really got all of the pieces that they need to, uh, to, to build these machines. How much money is being invested? Have you got any idea in, uh, worldwide? <laughs> so the, the short answer to that is no, I don't. But I can give you some indication of the scale of the public programs. You know, the, the UK has spent in or committed over the 
past five and for the next few years, uh, about a billion pounds. The uh, European Union quantum flagship program is about a billion euros. The, the US National Quantum Initiative uh, is one and a half billion dollars. Um, and then there are big programs in Singapore, in uh, China, a number of national programs within Europe as well, within Canada, uh, Australia, uh, and Japan. And of course, then there's a very big Chinese effort uh, centered around a number of their universities and big national institutes that are embedded in those, uh, which, um, which is of, of similar, probably larger scale. We also know, uh, and John alluded to this, uh, 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 space-based programs, uh, and those are happening in several countries. The Chinese have certainly got one. The Canadians are working on one. Um, so, so there's a significant amount of public money. Then also, uh, as noted earlier, uh, a number of big corporations are investing, Google, IBM, Microsoft. Uh, and so it, there's a considerable amount of money going into this. There's also the private venture capital that's going into lots of different startups. Some of those are a very significant scale uh, and, and others are a, a bit smaller. So by the time you add all that up, you know, a million here, a millionaire, pretty soon it adds up to real money. Yeah, so this is, this is really big, isn't it? Um, with such huge sums of money involved, though public money, as like you say, as well as the private money that's, that's there, um, I wonder, is, is, it, is that because uh, countries are really racing because they want to be the ones that develop it? Why, why would everybody be putting in so much? It seems to me that it's, it's obviously a, a big import to, these, um, to, 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 to nations around the world. Mm. Well, I, I think people, in my view, rightly see that the potential upside benefit of all this capability is really fantastic. In terms of absolute numbers, it does feel big, but of course, it's going to be very much smaller than the sorts of monies we need to put in to solve some of the problems around climate or what we already spend on healthcare or what have you. So I think the leverage that you get from that kind of investment is, is really quite large. I'm guessing some quantum computers will be used in helping us to fix the climate. So it's not necessarily separate to these issues, is it? It would be It would be nice to think that that's the case. And certainly chemistry algorithms uh, could well be useful in that regard, um, whether that's in, in things like improving plant yields, uh, better fertilizers, uh, uh, better... Uh, better pesticides or what have you, all of these kinds of things may, may be a possibility. Now, your company, Orca, uses photons, am I right, to create it, so to generate the, the qubits. Um, I hope I'm using the right terminology. Uh, what's the benefit, in your view, of photons over other forms, other ways of generating these qubits? I think it's called the architecture, is that right? Yes, uh, so using light as a platform uh, has has a number of a number of good features but but also some drawbacks so the the good features are that uh it it exhibits quantum features quite straightforwardly even under ambient conditions um because the the qubit energy if you like is so much greater than um than that of the of of the background so you don't need to you don't need to operate in a in a cooled environment um, a, a second feature is that it, it, it being light, it travels through transparent material and can be guided over very long distances. So you can use it to connect up different parts of a computer uh, uh, over over reasonable scale. And, and then third, you have a very high bandwidth, so you can, in principle, run things run things very very rapidly. Um, so th those are all the plus sides, and a lot of that also, a lot of the utility also derives from the fact that uh, photons don't talk to one another. So you tend not to lose your information once coded, other than the uh, other than one of the two key challenges, which is sometimes you lose photons entirely because um, the, the, you know, the, they get absorbed uh, in in the walls or something like that. And then the the second is that because photons don't don't talk to one another very readily, 
you can't do some of the key operations that are operative in, in, in John's superconducting platform, for instance. And therefore, you need a very, very different architecture for photons that, um, that, that utilizes those two features. Uh, and the way that works is that you use absorptive materials to detect the photons, and you use that detection operation as a means to generate the operations you need to, um, uh, to, to generate the quantum states that form the basis of the, of the quantum register. So, th th and those turn out to be, um, turn to, turn, those operations turn out to be the very hard thing to engineer for light. So what makes them hard to engineer? What are the challenges around those operations? The key challenge is that, um, you know, whereas John in his computer can say, I would like to have these two qubits talk to each other in a very specific way and can turn the dials to make that happen. In, a, in an optical computer and in the current architectures, what happens is that you, you can't say that. You can only say, uh, when these detectors fire, I know that I have generated the interaction that I wanted. And the and that that those that detector firing pattern is probabilistic. Sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. So the way you mitigate that is to have multiple tries at it. So you run all of these things at once, and then when they when one of them succeeds, you grab hold of that and start on the next round. And and so that is the that's sort of the the key difficulty you have. You have to have lots of copies of things all running at once. And then you have to pick out the one that, uh, that has succeeded in order to go on to the next operation. You've gone down the photon route because presumably that's, um, your, that's your, your light is your specialism. Um, John went down a superconducting route because he comes just from a different physics background. Do you have a feel for whether which, which architecture might be the one that wins out in the end? I think superconductors came, were... were um, were something that really took off uh, around John's work in the last uh, couple of decades. Um, so, so I think the, the there is always this this change and flux in the field. But given the given where we are at the moment, there seem to be three or four plausible platforms that that have the capabilities that we're looking for, and therefore are plausible candidates. Uh, notwithstanding some of the fierce engineering challenges that are needed to to actually get them to that that stage, but I, it may well be that it's not either or in this case, Helen. It may well be that what we find is that there is a sort of hybrid solution, where each of these technologies finds there's a there's a sort of um, engineering barrier that it can't quite get through. And the way to do that is to join up with a different kind of system. So the, so the concept of a, a quantum network that connects different scale processes or different types of processes, um, I think is, is, is one that has some, uh, has some probability of actually happening. So, so it may be, it may be all of the above. If you wanted to buy some quantum capability even now at the very, very basic level, um, as I understand it, it's still quite expensive. I mean, is it is it ever going to be affordable? Um, can, can we think of it as in that digital world as, you know, we, we, we started out with having these huge, great big mainframes that your um, a university used to have or a big organisation. Now everybody's got one um, at home. Is it, are we likely to get it so that everybody has, uh, it's affordable for everybody to be able to use? Will everybody want to use yeah, it? Yeah, I think let, let, I think that's the real question, Helen. Let, if we start with that one, will everybody want to use it? There's there's a huge amount of stuff that we use computers for every day that probably won't benefit from a quantum improvement. So why bother? So I think that will certainly remain, and uh, and there will be certain things that quantum computers are really good at. Uh, in which case, you'll you'll want to you'll want to have one around. Um, so I, I think the I think it's likely that these two things will coexist. And um, whether it turns out that you need a quantum computer on your desktop, I expect depends on whether you have any really quantum heavy tasks that you need to do. And I suspect that most people won't. Um, so that, I think that's what would then drive whether these things become really cheap or not. 
but either way, I think it is going to be, um, uh, you know, building size machines in the first instance uh, as we start to, to see them come online. Well, building size machines. So we're talking like at the size of, of a house. Yeah, is that what you mean? Well, that that sort of thing. You know, you need you need uh, you need the room to uh, to put all of the ancillary uh, bits of, of kit around to uh, to be able to to operate these machines in their current instantiation. And whilst a lot of work's going into making them uh, smaller and smaller, uh, more compact. Um, I think it's still going to still going to take that in the in the first instance, just just as the the first the first digital computers, as you rightly pointed out, were big things that sat in warehouses that uh, that that needed an army of people to operate them. Something in me though that says, you know, I, I never. Uh, before I knew I could watch films on my computer, I never wanted to. But now because I can, because the bandwidth is there and so on, um, we, we can do all these things that we never wanted to before because the capability was there. So we kind of invent things to do. We now want things that we didn't know we wanted in the first place. A bit like how did we ever manage to live without microwave ovens before we had one in the kitchen kind of thing. Um is it not likely that we're all going to somehow want just much more fast computing power um, for some other amazing thing that we'll put on our computers at home? We'll just have the information of, of uh, so much more information at our fingertips um, and rather than having to, um, to, 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 I don't know, to, to rely on these old fashioned digital things. Yeah. Well, wouldn't that be great if there was something that uh, something so vastly new out of it that, uh, that everybody wanted one. I, and, and if we knew what that was, um, that, that would be also fantastic. So uh, you, you're absolutely right that new technology enables new new sorts of uh, opportunity. And I, I, and I suspect that will be the case here. What about the energy consumption of quantum computers? Mm. Well, uh, let's see. In, in principle, of course, the great thing about quantum computing operations is they're all reversible until you make your final measurements. So the, the, in, in principle, they can have a much lower energy footprint than a regular computer. But uh, in practice, of course, they need a lot of uh, ancillary bits around them to, to make them function. And so at the moment, they, they are quite uh, energy intensive in, in that regard. Uh, whether you're cooling things down or you're operating lasers uh, or you've got uh, tons of control equipment, all, all of those use, use, use energy. Yeah. Is that going to reduce then as, um, as these things become um, more, let's say, uh, less researchy and more commercial? Well, if, if one can improve the, the qubits and reduce the, the er need for error correction, which requires, which requires measurements, which is where the energy dissipation ultimately comes from in these machines, then, uh, then one, one can improve it. But, uh, but I, think the, I think the dominant use of energy is going to be around all the ancillary stuff and not in the compute, quantum computer itself. So my, my guess is that uh, that's going to be a sort of constant threshold footprint for, uh, for energy use in these machines. Thank you, Ian. Now, just a quick reminder for listeners, we're keen to hear from you. Send us your thoughts, comments and questions through our Twitter channel at Zero Pressure Pod. I'd like to bring John back in here, if I may. How is this physical landscape of these quantum comp computers actually going to work? So, you know, Ian's been talking a bit about, you know, are we going to have have desktops or, or not and built, you know, computers the size of a house? So if we're not having them at home, how are we going to make use of them? How are we actually going to, to use them for the applications that perhaps those that we've discussed already? Yeah, so... Um... Uh, you know, you have to, I think, think a little bit about how you use a computer's just right now, these days, even this podcast. This podcast is going to communicate it and store it and, and compute it through a data center. Okay. And most of our interactions with the computer, say through our cell phone, is the cell phone just a data trans transmitter? It, it's going through a data center. So, the, uh, you know, the idea of, you know, the laptop and the desktop, it's still there. We have that. But most of the compute these days is in the data center. 
And there are good reasons for that, uh, you know, economies of scale and the like. And also, I think we see that it's kind of software is maybe easy to use when it's made uniform in this way. So I think uh, quantum computers will just follow that trend. They will be in data centers and we will remotely uh, access them in the way that we access many other powerful programs right now. And, uh, you know, that will be how normal people use them, uh, you know, for these special applications. Now, there might be, uh, you know, at a research lab or government institution where you may want to have your own to do that. But I don't see any reason why, uh, you know, anyone in particular wants to maintain this complicated piece of electronics uh, unless if, if someone else can do that for them. So uh, I, I think that's more what more the model of what's going to happen in the future. So is that what you would say, Ian? I mean, are you, you imagining people just somehow have access to your um, your your quantum computers that are the size of a building? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's uh, that is the way it's going to to work. And of course, I will put in a plug in for light on that platform because the way that all of the information that, that we're now using gets to that data center is is an optical network. Uh, so the ability to have quantum communications between quantum data centers, I think, is uh, is quite a likely landscape, as as John indicates. I'll, I'll ask ask Ian this one. What c- kind of regulation of quantum computers do you think might be needed? Um, I suppose I'm always a bit concerned that um, that some rogue person or possibly even a rogue state might get hold of some really amazing technology and use it against others in the world. I, well, I think we have frameworks that we can draw upon. And, and I think the, f- the first one is that that is very common in all technologies of this kind is going to be a sort of standards framework. Um, and that, that I think, will, will be a very, very helpful and necessary one for this, for this capability to grow. And then the second, uh, a, a more, a more a regulatory framework, I think, I think is the same kind of discussion that we had have about internet or broadcast use uh, of those kind of technologies. Um, I, I think it would be would be also helpful for us to be thinking about what this responsible use framework looks like. But I I think that's a very hard thing to put into a regulatory framework. Uh, But I I think what's crucial is that we start to have those kinds of discussions between between nations or governments at, at an early stage as the capabilities of this technology unfolds. And um, basically, we're talking about uh, the potential for using a new kind of supercomputer based on quantum. And right now, we we have classical supercomputers. People do worry about how they're going to be used. And there is like a framework for understanding uh, these kind of issues with supercomputers. So I think you have a lot to call upon. Uh, based on what people are already doing for these use cases. And you have to generalize it a little bit more for quantum computers and the like. But uh, I think people are already looking at these kind of problems and you just need to uh, expand expand the way people are looking at supercomputer usage in this way. Are we going to see a growth in software companies, do you think, in anticipation of the hardware that we've yet to see? Well, there already has been a growth and there's been quite a few companies formed to look at this. And I think that's very healthy and useful and the like. And actually, I think it's more of an issue looking into the future, whether um, people investing in this, in these companies, are going to be able to stick it out until we build bigger, bigger machines or you know whether we can discover uh, application uh, soon enough so that people see that there, there's good. So I think there's been good investment. It's a matter of continuing that if we don't see a big application coming out in the next few years. And you know everyone's working hard on that, and we'll just have to have to see what happens, uh, see what what people can invent. 
So, Ian, what does Orca need in terms of technological development? What what would give Orca the sort of a really good kickstart at the moment? I think uh, the the answer to that is uh, some Im- improvements in some of the photonic components, some of the switching technology, and in in detectors. Uh, I think that that there is also a sort of um, uh, quantum enhancement to the market, if you like. Here, that is, there are the there are improvements to componentry for quantum devices that also have a knock-on effect in in the current markets. You know, if you can build lower noise, high efficiency, faster photo, uh, photo detectors, then they they can automatically give you an advantage in even a classical network, for example. So I think there is a there is a way in which all of the effort that goes into building the quantum technology automatically gives you a little bit of an advantage or a, a spillover into into current markets too. And that's a bit of a spur as well. And is there a lot of competition out there? Who's this, who's is going to be the the platform that actually makes it through in the end? Yeah, there's lots of competition, and that's uh, that's a good thing. <laughs> Spurs people to be creative. Yeah, and and I know in our field, people are doing different things, and you can learn from all of that. You know, again, I try to synthesize a global model of what works and what doesn't work, and I try to take in all this as data to understand that. And it's, of course, specifically in my way, we do the experiments, but you can learn things from the the other projects too, um, especially as you're trying to put together these systems. Finally, final question to you both. Um, This podcast does have um, rather an interest in aerospace and defense industries. Um, What do you see the potential of quantum computing for those industries in particular? Well, clearly a, a big part of the defense industries now is uh, security and information warfare, if you like. And, uh, you know, these kind of powerful computers are important uh, components for that. And uh, people have been thinking about it for a while. And uh, it's a, of national interest, of course. So, uh, yeah, that's something that these these industries need to know about. It's good that they have a podcast here to educate uh, more people about what's happening in this field. Yeah, and I, I would add that the, the other big issue for uh, defense applications is logistics. And that's where the role in optimization becomes critically important. Yeah, thank you, Ian. And I think um, you both mentioned new materials as well. So I can see these wonderful, amazing light materials, um, aircraft, spacecraft, um, and and many other applications. How far away do you think we are from delivering something really tangible that's going to be a, a public benefit, a real sort of transformational game changer in world capabilities? Well, there's, uh, there's there's a lot of freight in that question, Helen. I, I I think that there are there are these stages of development. So the sorts of machines that we we have at the moment can solve interesting and important um, problems, but not yet ones that are really having a, a, a direct public benefit, if you like. But there are there are s- stages at which this scales up. For example. Uh, at the very simplest level, the sort of one qubit level, there's the there's the notion that you can do truly random uh, number generation, and that turns out to be an important seed for all kinds of things, from uh, uh, simulations of markets to generating uh, 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 code pads for um, uh, for secure communications or what have you. So there's a sort of trivial and small example, but if you build up from there then you can build into the sort of specialist processor kind of activity where you might use a small quantum processor in uh, connected to and working with a conventional high performance computer to do some some specialized bits in the quantum processor that then feed into a bigger algorithm. Uh, And then you move into the the scale, the the, um, intermediate scale that, that John talked about where you, you have a little more capability directly in the quantum domain before you get to this fully scalable computer. So I, I think you can already begin to see the first steps along that trajectory 
yielding some some uh, some benefit. There are already people selling quantum random number generators, for example, um, which, which, whilst hardly a computer, is at least an indication of of a move along that 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 trajectory. Look, thank you both. As we come to the end of this really interesting discussion, looking at the possibilities of quantum computing and the route to potentially getting us where we want to be, wherever that might be in the future, it's clear that it's likely to be quite transformative, I think, and have profound effects on not just the aeronautics and defence industries, but on society in general. Breakthroughs in medicine, solving complex logistical problems of transport systems and manufacturing, further development of artificial intelligence and secure communication. Look, it's been a gripping and fascinating discussion. Thank you to both John and Ian for sharing your insights and experiences with us. Thank you, Helen. It's great, uh, great to have the chance to talk with you. Yes, thank you again. And thank you for listening and for joining us on this podcast journey. If this conversation about quantum computing has got you thinking and you'd like to ask me or our guests any questions, please do reach out to us on Twitter at Zero Pressure Pod. We may even feature your questions in the next episode, which will examine the future of human machine teaming. Now, here's some questions I received from our last discussion on artificial intelligence. The first one was, when you travelled into space, how reliant was your vessel on artificial intelligence, on AI? The answer to this one is that I flew in 1991, right? So <laughs> when the machine learning wave of AI was only really just beginning and our pretty basic computers on board our spacecraft were as big as suitcases, but they did have some decision-making capacity, I suppose, but we didn't think of it as being AI. I mean, there was still an awful lot of astronaut input generally, as well as having that manual override when necessary. Now, the second question I've got, would Helen let herself be driven by an AI car? Well, for sure. I mean, with manual override at the moment, but at some point, I think reliability will become so good that it'll be safer to be only autonomous. I've thought about this quite a bit, actually, since those episodes on autonomous systems and artificial intelligence. It's only after we've experienced working with it and it's being consistent and reliable will we feel comfortable to trust it. Now, here's a question about data diversity. How can we increase data diversity used in AI systems? Now, I think this question refers in particular to the kind of diversity that we're talking about when we're thinking of perhaps that facial recognition um, software that seems to recognize white men over and above other people in the world. Now, there seems to be no single answer to this. It does rather depend on where the system's to be used and how it can be trained. But recognizing that data can be biased is an important start so that we can compare and validate different samples of training data to make it more representative. But a big part is ensuring that the team of people working on any AI project is diverse itself, and ideally at least as diverse as the people who will be using the system that's being developed. I just want to remind you that you can submit comments and questions via our podcast Twitter, at Zero Pressure Pod. We're keen to hear from you and may even feature your questions in the next episode, so please do get in touch. I look forward to hearing from you and to our next discussion. In the meantime, I leave you with the words of Werner Heisenberg, German theoretical physicist and one of the pioneers of quantum mechanics. He said, not only is the universe stranger than we think, it's stranger than we can think. <laughs>